like to extend a warm welcome to each who has come this evening and also express the appreciation for the opportunity to share the message of the gospel. Um, uh, I'm grateful that you've come, and I know that not only am I grateful, but I know that um, the very God of heaven is grateful that you're here. And the reason being is because the word of God tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 tells us that, that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you never hear the truth of the word of God, if you never hear the truth, you won't know. Um, the same passage would go on to tell us that how will they know if they if they haven't heard? How how do you know if you if you haven't heard? Today we were talking about with some acquaintance, with some friends, we were talking about education and just talking about knowledge and learning and how the the just knowledge comes from God, how it is so good just to know, just to learn things and just to keep learning. But one of the things that we must learn, that we must know, is the truth of the gospel. And the reason that we're here tonight is to share the message of the gospel with you. It's so that if the, you are here, and, 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 and if you don't know your sins forgiven, that you might know your sins forgiven. You might know the purpose of life. You know, we live in a world that, that um, really so many around us and, and in the world, they don't have a clue what the purpose of life is. What's the reason that we live and why are we here? Why, what, 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 what's it all about? Is it, is it just to be born and, and, and to live life and, and to go through your, your schooling and your education and then to, to grow up and to, uh, to get a job and maybe to get married and then maybe to, after you're married, you just kind of go to work and you come home from work and you go to work and you come home from work and then you get talking to a fellow this week, week. He says, I want to retire when I'm 65. And he says, and I'm going to retire and then I'm going to finally do what I, I've always wanted to do. And I thought, well, are you sure you're going to be able to do what you want to do at 65? You know, that was my thought. But is it really the purpose of life? Is that all? No, not at all. We have a purpose. And the purpose of our existence is to glorify the God of heaven, to glorify the one who, who created us, to bring him honor and glory, to get to know him. He loves you. You know, God loves you. We've just been thinking about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jeremy mentioned a couple of times in his message about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and his birth. And, and I want to talk to you tonight about the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to talk to you about him because without him, we have no purpose in life. Without him, we're lost. Without him, we can't help ourselves. Without him, you cannot have life eternal. You see, we live and we die, but the word of God tells us that there's life after death. There is there's judgment yet to come. And I just want to read a few verses from the word of God. Let's read first in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. I'm going to read a few of the reasons that the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15 says this. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. It says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation or worthy to be accepted. It should be accepted by everyone that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then the writer writes here of whom I am chief. But Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You know. I was thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming. It wasn't a, a, too many years ago, maybe, um, let me get, see, maybe 21 or 22 years ago, 23 years ago. Um, I was sitting in a Tim Hortons in Woodstock, Ontario with a fellow by the name of Kevin beside me. And he was working for me at that time. And I started to chit chat with Kevin and I started to tell him a little bit about the Lord Jesus Christ. It was, it was getting late in the year and we were actually there. It was on a, it was on a Sunday night. Really, it was it was going into Monday morning. So what had happened is the the local owner of the Canadian Tire Store called me Sunday afternoon, and he says, "Listen, somebody lit a bale on fire in my parking lot." He says, "Can you go clean it up?" And I says, "I can. I'll do that after the gospel service tonight. I'll go into town. I'll get that all cleaned up for you, so you're good to open Monday morning." And so I called Kevin up, and I said, "Kevin, I says I'm going to the gospel meeting, but after the gospel meeting, we're going to go clean up the bale." 
at the at the park. And so we, we went and we went and did that. And then after, well, it was kind of nippy out. It was chilly. And, and I says, well, why don't we, we go across the road to the Tim Hortons? There's a new Tim Hortons there. And I says, let's go across and have a Timmy's. And so there we sat in the Tim Hortons. And I started to talk to Kevin about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what he told me? Kevin thought that the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world and was born of a virgin and born in that little town of Bethlehem, he, he thought it was just a legend. He thought it was just a fib. He thought it was just a story that somebody made up. And, and he, he was, well, I don't know, he must have been 20 years old at the time, 18, 19, 20, I don't know how old he was, but he, but he thought really that the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming was just a joke. Like he thought it was just a storybook. And that's what he thought. That's all he knew. And then I told him of, of how, how the Lord came. And not only did, was he born in Bethlehem, but that he died at the cross of Calvary. And I told him about that. And he, he, he didn't know about it. And maybe there's someone here tonight that you've maybe heard a lot about Christ. Maybe you've heard about Jesus. Maybe you've been raised in, 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 in and around the gospel. But I have a question for you tonight. Do you know him? Do you know him in your heart? Is he your savior? What does he mean to you? You see, even our calendar, I was looking at the calendar, you know, we were coming across Northern Ontario this past summer and we stopped at Mr. Winnie the Pooh there up in Northern Ontario. I don't know if you've ever gone across the North, driven across the North, but you kind of hard to miss Winnie the Pooh and White River. You come to White River and there's a big statue on the South side of the road um, and it's Winnie the Pooh. I went and stood beside Winnie the Pooh to get my picture. And you know what it says? On the little plaque in front of Winnie the Pooh, it says, in the year of our Lord, 19, I don't know, I have the picture on my phone. It says, in the year of our Lord. And I thought, well, why does it say in the year of our Lord? Why does it say that? In front of the Winnie the Pooh statue, it says, in the year of our Lord, 1900 and whatever. Why does it say that? Well, it's because... It's because a little over 2,000 years ago, some very, very interesting things happened. Very, very interesting things happened. We read here that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, it says Christ Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. In Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8, it says that he came to save the ungodly. You know, my grandfather was 90, sorry, 90, 80 to 82 years old sitting in the kitchen. And my father read that verse to him. You know, my grandfather went to Sunday school when he was a little boy. He wasn't saved. 82 years old, still not saved. And my father read him that verse in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. And he says, Christ came and he died for the ungodly. Died for the ungodly. You know what grandpa said? I'm not ungodly. He said, I'm not ungodly. He says, I'm a good person. Just so you might know, I observed my grandfather chase my grandmother with an axe because he was mad. If you were to sit with my mother and talk to my mother and to my aunts and my uncles, they would tell you of how he would come home drunk on the weekend after work, drunk as drunk gets, and he would come and he would beat his children. His little daughters and his little sons would climb up into the attic where he couldn't fit, scared and trembling, trembling because they were scared of him. And you know what he said? He says, I'm not an ungodly man. Is there someone here tonight that thinks that somehow you're not ungodly? Is there someone here tonight that thinks that you're not a sinner? The word of God tells us that we've all sinned. We've all sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. No righteous man. No righteous woman on earth. All are sinners. You see, until you come to a place and a realization that you are the sinner that you are, and until you come to the realization that you are ungodly the way that you are ungodly, until you come to the realization that you are lost and without Christ, you know, I got a phone call this week, a young man. Oh, I know, he must be 18, 19 years old. He started Tuesday morning, 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning. Got out in behind the shop with the sandblaster, and he's working all day sandblasting equipment. About three o'clock in the afternoon, he's been thinking about his sin. He's been thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been thinking that he can't help himself. And that afternoon, I got a call a little later, a little later, maybe five o'clock or so. But guess what? 
He realized that he was lost and without a savior and he couldn't help himself. And that the only one that could save him was the Lord Jesus Christ. He got saved Tuesday. Precious thing. Another soul in the kingdom of heaven. Another child of God. Another soul on his way to heaven on the narrow road which leads to life. But I'm going to tell you tonight, if you cannot accept the fact that you're a sinner, if you can't accept the fact that you're ungodly, if you can't accept the fact that you're lost, you're never going to get the Savior. You're never going to find the Savior. Because Christ Jesus came into the world to save the sinner. He came into the world to seek the lost. And he came and he died for the ungodly. And you see, if you're not lost, and you're not ungodly, and you're not a sinner, he didn't come for you. But the truth is that he did come for you. Okay? He did come for you. You might not realize that you are who you are. Or you might be fighting with the fact that you are what the word of God says you are. But the truth remains that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Lord Jesus Christ loves you. So what I was saying is that there's some interesting things. This calendar that we have, you know, we're 2023, printed off a whole bunch of calendars. I got a whole bunch of calendars to give out to people. Bible verses on them. I like calendars. You know, they have a, a, a good use. I got a verse on each day. So that way, when you look at the calendar, there's a verse for every day. So when you get looking at it, there's a verse just for you for the day. But, you know, the, the, the very year, 2023, you know, what, what, what that's about is that about a little over 2,000 years ago, some very interesting things happened. And, and we could take time to read them. And I would like to read them. But there's probably, uh, um, time's going to get away on us. But, but what happened that back then is that, that Mary was, was in her home. Actually, let's just read it. We'll just read the passage just so you can see what it says. Uh, we'll re read in Luke chapter 1 because I think it's fitting uh, even for the, for the time of year that we're in. Um, Luke chapter 1, and we'll read starting in verse number 26. It says this, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. Now, I'm just going to stop there for a minute. To a virgin. There's, it's very interesting that it says that here. The, the, the angel was sent to a virgin. And if we were to go back into the Old Testament, back into Isaiah chapter 7, it's going to tell us in the 14th verse of Isaiah 7 that, that a virgin was going to be found with child. Okay? And that was prophesied hundreds of years prior to this happening here in 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 Bethlehem in, Naz uh, in Bethlehem, this happened way before. Sorry, in Nazareth. So this this happened many many years before. And here here is Mary in Nazareth, and it says the angel of God came unto her to a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind, what manner of salutation should this be? And the angel said unto her, fear not, Mary, don't be scared. Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I, I know not a man? I'm not married. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God and behold thy cousin Elizabeth. She hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren for with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, behold thy handmaid. Her story, behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her and Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste into the city of Judah. And entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. 
And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord, listen to this, the mother of my Lord should come to me. That means that the, the, the child in the womb of Mary was the Lord himself. And she says, whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she, she's now speaking about Mary, and blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, Behold, my soul doth magnify the Lord. And we can keep reading of Mary's um, praise to the Lord. And then we can keep going in, in, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 1. I'm going to read there too, just because I think it's important. Luke 2, 1. And it came to pass in those days that there was a decree that went out from August Caesar Augustus and that all, the, that all the world should be taxed. And the taxing was first made when Cyrenus was governor over Syria or of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David. And he, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. They were scared too. And the angel said unto them, fear not. Second time we hear that. Fear not for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into the heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now, I know we've done a lot of reading, and, and I don't apologize for that because it's the word of God. And I, I just want you to think about this. So a little over 2,000 years ago, some very, very interesting and very strange and abnormal things took place. So we have this virgin, this Mary, who is, who is promised, so she's engaged to Joseph. And Joseph has gone his way, and he's, he's probably preparing a, a home and, and he's preparing a place to bring her back to once they are married. And in that process of time, Gabriel comes to her as it was prophesied in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 7 and 14. Gabriel comes to her and she's a virgin. And he says, you're going to have a child. And she says, well, how's this? I'm not married. And he says, well, the, the, the Lord's going to put that child in you. And you're going to give birth to that child. Stunning, 100% impossible. You can, uh, there's doctors present here tonight, I believe. And you can ask a doctor, that's not happening. That's impossible. But it happened. It's the truth. It's the word of God. God said it. And when God says something, he does what he says. And if God says yes, it's yes. If he says no, it's no. If he says that your sin is taking you to a lost eternity, it's taking you to a lost eternity. If he tells you that, that the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sin at the cross of Calvary, you can be absolutely sure that when he died at the cross of Calvary, he died for your sin because God said it. You see, so Mary, she's found with child. She goes up to Elizabeth and, you know, they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have WhatsApp. They didn't have Instagram. They didn't, I don't know, all these things. They didn't, they didn't have Facebook. You know, they didn't have all this stuff, email and cell phone message and, and text message and all this stuff. But she knew that Mary was, that, that Elizabeth was his child. Why? Well, because Gabriel told her. 
And so she goes up into the hill country of Judah and she gets up there and she finds Elizabeth. She comes to the house and she, she greets her cousin, Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was already old. She was barren. She had never had children. And, 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 and the Lord had told her, Gabriel had told Mary that Elizabeth was also with child. Another impossibility. 100% impossibility. Impossible, humanly speaking. Medically speaking, impossible. And here this Elizabeth, she's with child. Old already. Too old to have children. She's barren and she has this child. Six months away, six months long. She's already got quite a, quite a belly. Doesn't she? And Mary comes in. And it says that the moment that Mary said what she said, greeted her, it says the babe leaped in her womb. With joy is what Elizabeth says. The baby leaped with joy in the womb of Elizabeth. With joy. You see these things that are happening? You see, you can't deny God made very, very sure that he was going to make no mistake that you, you can't get confused about what happened 2,000 plus years ago. You can't get confused about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. He, his birth cannot be confused with the birth of any other. There was none other that was ever born of a virgin. Totally impossible. The, 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 this one that came and, and the whole fact that God planned it this way is completely impossible to confuse it with any other situation, no, any other birth on earth. You get it? Mary's with child. Not only this. Elizabeth has her child. I guess I didn't do the math, but three months later. Sorry, six months later. Mary gives birth, doesn't she? She gives birth. What happens at Mary's birth? At the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we just read it. It was, it was a different situation. So they're going up to be taxed. Joseph's taking Mary with him and, and they go up to Bethlehem and they get to Bethlehem and evidently there's no room for them in the end. I don't know if it was because of poverty. There's lots of uh, assumption around that. We really don't know, but what we do know is that there was no room in the end. And what we do know is that the Lord Jesus Christ was born in a very, very impoverished place. And, and he was placed in a manger, the feeding trough, as it were, for, for the animals. It was just the trough. And, and, and without doubt, Mary and Joseph made somewhat of a commodious spot there, the best that they could with what they had, and, and they laid the Lord there. But something very interesting happened. Why? So that you, my friend, tonight cannot confuse the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ with the birth of any other. God promised that the Messiah was going to come. He promised that, that, that Jesus Christ was going to come, that the Savior was going to come. Remember what Elizabeth said. How is it that the mother of my Lord, what is she saying? She's saying that the child that's in the womb of Mary is her Lord. She says, how is it that the mother of my Lord comes to visit me? See, she acknowledged that the womb, that the child in the womb of Mary was the very God of heaven. God manifest in human flesh. And you see, the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world in such a manner that it's completely impossible to confuse it with any other. You know something I find interesting? These guys, these farmers, they're out in the field. And I, I appreciate this a little bit. But anyway, these guys, they're out in the field, these, these shepherds. And they're really farmers. They're, they're sheep farmers. And, and, and it's quite the job, I think, to farm sheep. Um, number one, uh, anybody that's farmed sheep and worked with sheep, uh, I, don't, I, I don't like to use that word dumb, but really, you know, they're, they're, they're not very smart, it seems. And you have to, you really have to look after them. And sheep aren't, they can't defend themselves. They're, they don't defend themselves. They, if, you know, if a wolf or a coyote or something comes in, they're just, they're, they're kind of on their own. They, 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 they're, they're, they're going to get overtaken. And if a little sheep, even a bigger sheep gets tripped over, somebody bumps them and they, they tip over and they get up on their back. They're kind of top heavy, you know, if they're flipped over, you know, they're, they're, they're top heavy as it is. And you see, if they get flipped over and they get up on their back, they get their legs, they can't roll over. It's impossible for them to get back onto their feet. If they're on their back and a little bit of a dip, doesn't take much of a dip, but sheep won't get back on his feet. And you see, it's a full-time job for a shepherd to look after these little guys. And, and they're, they're keeping track of everything and they're watching and they're observing and they're, and they're looking and they're caring. But these guys, these shepherds, they're in the 
field looking after their flocks of sheep and probably a little green grass in the area and they're moving their sheep along the way and they're out in the middle of the night it says in the night looking after the sheep and guess what happens an angel shows up an angel shows up and the angel says something really neat has just happened there's a baby that's been born in Bethlehem a little baby He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's the Messiah. He's the promised one. He's the Christ. He's the Savior. Do you know who he is? And they tell, that angel tells the shepherds. I don't know how many shepherds. It doesn't tell us, but there's a number of shepherds. And these guys, they are they probably stink. They probably haven't had a shower in who knows how long. Where they came from, we don't know. But I, they're, they're, you get what I'm saying? They're just simple guys. They're just simple, humble folk. That's what I like about the Lord. You know, the Lord loves everyone. The Lord just loves everyone, everyone right across the world. You don't have to have a big education. You don't have to be well-known. You don't have to be famous. The Lord loves you just the way that you are. If somebody, if you ever get the feeling that nobody loves you, I want to let you know you're wrong. God loves you. And you are loved. You're loved by your creator. You're loved by the God of heaven. You're loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And these men, they're in the field. And I don't know, why didn't, why didn't the angel go to the synagogue? Why didn't the angel wake up the priest in the temple? Huh? You ever wonder? I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is that God had a very special reason for letting those shepherds know. And those shepherds were, I don't know if they were awake or they weren't awake. What happened? But the angel shows up and he gives them the news. And, and while the angel's communicating this with them, a whole host of heavenly beings presences themselves i don't know what that would have been you know i've heard over five thousand people sing a song before how great thou art heard over five thousand people one time sing how great thou art. i'll tell you that's amazing i thought this must be what heaven's going to be like i love to hear good singing i love to hear hundreds if not thousands of people sing praises to the lord it's an amazing thing but there was a lot of heavenly hosts showed up that day, the Lord Jesus Christ was born. And I cannot help but think that the townsfolk and the people around about wonder, where, where, you hear that? Did you hear that? Did it wake somebody up? Was there a mother that was looking after her child at night and she, she heard this, this singing? What? I don't know. But the shepherds heard it. And the host sang. And they sang praises to the Lord. You know what the shepherds said? They said, let's go. Let's, the, the, the host laughed the angel laughed everybody laughed and it's just the shepherds left in the field and they thought well we heard this i mean there's a bunch of us here we all saw it this isn't an impossibility this, this is this happened and they're looking at each other's like this is real did you see that yeah i saw that did you see that? Yeah, i saw that did you hear that yeah i heard it. okay so i wasn't sleeping i'm not dreaming we all heard and saw the same thing and these guys they get up and they go to bethlehem you know what they find in bethlehem exactly what the angel said. Remember what I said? If God says something, God means what he says. There's no confusing. You cannot confuse the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ with any other birth. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You know, I want to talk to you a little bit about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born. We could go on and talk about the things that he did on earth, impossible things. He gave sight to the mind. You know, we have a son has just one eye. You know, I don't know how many times he's mentioned it. would be really neat to have two eyes. There's people that are blind and can't see anything. They'd love to see something. The Lord gave sight to the blind. I like it in Spanish. There's a passage. Remember when the Lord makes mud, the Lord Jesus, he made a little bit of mud. It says he spit in the ground and he made some mud. And really what it, and it put it in his eye. If you read it in Spanish, it kind of gives you the idea that he actually made another eyeball. You know, kind of, it's like, it's not like he just put mud in there. It's like, it's almost like he made an eye and put it there. I don't know. But what we do know is that the man came away and he saw and his vision was restored to him. And you see, the Lord did many, many things like this. He rose uh, those that were dead. They were, they, remember the woman of Naim, she's going outside of town and she's taking her son to the graveyard and, and, and she's mourning and she's, she's a widow and she's already lost her husband, evidently, and now she's lost her son. And, and the Lord comes and he has compassion. And he comes up to that box, that 
that casket and he and he touches that and he gets that boy that that guy came right out of the casket that day what a funeral procession put yourself in the shoes of the people there that day and the joy and, and the mixture with of emotions one minute you're bawling your eyes out because you're sad and and sorrowful and you're brokenhearted for this woman who's a widow and has lost now her son and she has no source of income no source of of, of comfort and, and and she's just lost and then all of a sudden the lord comes along and, and this guy comes out of the casket just imagine what would you do you know now now you're crying for joy one minute you're crying for of sadness and the next minute you're crying for joy but you know what the lord did it there's no confusing it he did it lazarus dead four days and in the tomb remember he comes and he talks to mary and martha and he says where did you lay him they say well he stinks already you can't go there lord says did i not tell you that if you would just believe you would see. Did I tell you that? You see, when the Lord says something, he means what he says. And so they take him to the place where Lazarus had been, had been laid. And the Lord says, take away the stone. And they take the stone away. And the Lord calls out and he says, Lazarus, come, come here. Come out. Come forth. And this man who's wrapped in grave clothes, according to the custom of the Jews, he comes out of the grave. And, and he presences himself before the Lord. And you know what the Lord says to the people standing there? He said, loose him and let him go. What does that mean? That means that he couldn't run away. He couldn't, he, he, he couldn't walk the way that he was. He was still all wrapped up. But they, let, they unwound him and let him go. And you know what? The Jewish people, the Jewish leaders, they sought, it says that they sought to put Lazarus to death. Because so many people were following the Lord Jesus Christ after he raised him from the dead. This is just history, folks. It's just history. Read your Bible. Read historians. Read history. It's the truth. The Lord Jesus Christ raised Lazarus from the dead. And then they wanted to kill both Jesus and Lazarus because they were so upset that people were following this man who could raise people from the dead. Do you know who Jesus is? This baby that was born in Bethlehem, but from the virgin, born of a virgin. This baby that was born in such impoverished condition. The very God of heaven manifest in human flesh. See, he came because he loves you. He came. Why did he come? We read 1 Timothy chapter 1 and 15. He came to save sinners whom I am chief. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. John, or Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, he came to save the ungodly. He died for the ungodly. You see, that's why he came. And you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, not only in his birth and in his life, but in his death, you know, you can't confuse it. That's why we have the calendar the way we have the calendar. You can't deny it. But something very unique happened at the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Something completely, completely, very, very strange. And the Lord Jesus Christ died at the cross of Calvary. Now, there's many, many details that we could go and look at. And I would encourage you to read, read your Bible. Take time to read your Bible. If you, if you have a Bible, read your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, get a Bible, read your Bible. Read it. Because it's the word of God. And it's the truth. And it's history. It's history. It's the most accurate piece of history that we have. But the Lord Jesus Christ was, died at the cross of Calvary. And they took him down from the cross and they placed him in the tomb. Now, if you read Matthew's account, it's going to tell you that the Jewish leaders went to Pilate. Okay, so the Jewish leaders go to Pilate, the, the Roman leader, the Roman governor. And they said, listen, this guy's a crazy man. Okay. They said, this guy, he, he's been doing all kinds of strange things. And he told the people that on the third day he was going to rise again. Now, we're scared that this man, Jesus Christ, that we just crucified, and that you told the soldiers to, to, to break his legs, but they didn't because he was dead already. That man, we're scared that his disciples are going to come and steal him by night. So we want you to put a, a guard of soldiers around that tomb. And so Pilate says, okay, that's fine. Take the soldiers, go put a guard there. And not only that, but you could seal the tomb. So I don't know how they sealed it. They put fresh concrete on there and some kind of seal. I don't know what they did, but apparently they sealed the tomb. 
whatever they did to do that. And the guards are watching. You know what happened on the third day? It tells us that on the third day, there's an angel came down from heaven. You know why the angel came down? It says to move the stone. That's what it says. It says to move the stone out of the way. And you know what was inside the tomb? Nobody was in there. But there was something in there. There was his clothes. Like there was his, what he was wrapped with. And there was the, 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 the towel that was wrapped around his head was set in a separate place. That's what was in there. And the soldiers that were watching this were so scared stiff. They were trembling. I, 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 I don't know what I would have done. But these guys, they were watching awake because they went back to the city and they told them what had happened. They said, listen, they went, you know, they didn't go to Pilate or they didn't go to Pilate. They went to the Jewish leaders. Those soldiers go back to the Jewish leaders and they said, listen, this and this happened. Like this is, this is, this is, oh, they're just scared. Can you imagine? So you're watching and then all of a sudden that this angel comes from heaven and opens the tomb and there's a bright light and it's just, it's just something they had never, ever, ever, ever experienced in their lives. And they go and tell the Jewish leaders what happened. You know what the Jewish leader said? They said, you go tell the pilot that they told, stole him while you slept. Go lie to him. And he says, and if he gets you in trouble, we'll cover for you. And they gave him a bunch of money. And he says, there, we'll pay you off. We'll bribe you. We'll give you all this money. You keep your mouth shut about what actually happened. And you go tell Pilate and anybody that asks. You tell them that you were sleeping and they stole them. My friend, it's tough to, tough to hide from God. You know what they didn't count for? You see, when the Lord rose from amongst the dead, you know what Matthew tells us? That many of the saints which slept arose too. Okay? <laughs> many of the saints which slept, they also arose. Not just Christ. I don't know how many. 100? 50? 500? I don't know. But there were a lot of funerals before the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And those people that were believers, that were saints, arose at the resurrection of Christ. And they were found walking back in Jerusalem. Can you imagine how strange that would have been? So you own the local grocery store in the corner. And there's a guy that comes in every day. And all of a sudden he doesn't come in. And a week later his wife comes in. And you say, well, what happened? Where's your husband? Well, he died. Oh, I'm sorry. We buried him, yeah. Okay. And the next guy, right? You're the doctor and you've been attending this man. He's been sick and he dies. And you go to the funeral because you love the family and you're with the family. You go to the funeral and you bury him. You see where they're buried. And this happens time and time and time and time again. And then all of a sudden, the Lord Jesus Christ dies outside of Jerusalem. He's buried. He arises from amongst the dead. But not only that, but all these other people show up in Jerusalem out of the tombs and they're walking around in town. You get this, my friend? There's no confusing the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ came. And there's no confusing the fact that he's the resurrection and the life. And there's no confusing the fact that he's the Savior. You see, God wants to save you tonight. We've come to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ because there's nobody like him. There's no one that can save you except him. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He died for the ungodly. That's why he died. He didn't die because he was an unrighteous man. He didn't die because he was a sinner. No, no, no. He died because I'm a sinner. He died because you're a sinner. He died because you're ungodly. The word of God tells us that it was the just one, Jesus Christ, that died for the unjust ones. That's us. That's me. That's you. You know what he wants from you? He wants to thank you. He wants you to accept the fact that what the word of God says about you is true. What does the word of God say about you and about me? I don't want to be offensive. I just want to tell you the truth. I'm not going to offend. The word of God says that all have sinned. The word of God says we're all sinners. But you know, the message of the gospel is, is that Christ Jesus came to save the sinner. He came to die for you. He came to pay the price for you. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you trust him? Do you believe him? 
Do you know him? Did he die for you? Can you say with me? Yes, he died for me. I hope you can. Because you can. If you acknowledge that what God says is true. About you and about Christ. You can be saved tonight. That's what believing is. Faith. That's what faith is. Faith is hearing. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. Faith, word, word of God. Faith is hearing and acting upon what I heard. Doing something about what I heard. You've heard tonight that this man, Jesus Christ, not only was born under unique circumstances, not only did he live a unique life, not only did he die in a unique way, but he arose again in an extremely unique way. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. May the Lord bless his word.